Hello everybody and welcome to our third and final webinar of our, our March webinar series. And today we're going to hear from Paco Hope who will be talking to you a little bit about the three top techniques for web security testing using a proxy. And if you have any questions for Paco about his webinar, if you want to just discuss any of the things that he's going to go through over the next hour, just type your questions into the questions field on your control panel. And then at the very end of the webinar, we'll go through the questions one by one. And you do not have to wait until the very end to get your question in. Just type them at any point during the webinar and we'll get to them a little later. So I'm now going to hand you over to Paco. Hi, Paco. Hi, Dara. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Dara said, my name is Paco Hope, and I'm going to talk to you about using a proxy for web security testing. Uh, I'm going to show you three sort of fundamental techniques for doing this. Uh, now, these techniques are pretty useful if you're testing a, a web application for sure, but you can also use these if you were testing, say, a mobile application and you're trying to get at the microservices that power that mobile application. So there's a lot of applicability for the testing techniques that I'm talking about. Now, we're going to go right from the ground up and we're going to discover you know, a bit about HTTP and how proxies work generally. And then we're going to move up into like the security testing. If you've used a proxy before, if you've done this before, there may be some basic bits at the beginning that you already understand, but stay till the end because the clever bits come at the end. Uh, if you've never done this before, if you've never used a proxy for web security testing or even just web app testing, you're going to learn a few things right from the get-go and we'll get all the way out into some really interesting security testing. Just briefly, to give you an idea of who I am and, and what I do, um, I've been a software security consultant for quite a while now, and I work for a consulting company, and, and we go out and work with people who build software, and we try to help them build it securely. Um, I've been working on security testing for some time, and that's as opposed to, say, penetration testing, but actually helping folks who do software testing, functional testing, UAT, helping those folks get security into what it is that they do. Uh, I'm certified, the certi Certified Information System Security Professional, the CISSP, but I don't just have that certification. I actually write some of the exam questions that go onto that exam. So I've been involved in information security for some time. And I really am passionate about testers and the folks who do software testing being one of the most sort of underutilized resources in security testing generally. I think there's an awful lot uh, that we can do by empowering uh, testers to do more with security. So what we're going to do today is we're going to understand HTTP and how proxies fit in the big picture. And I'm going to walk you through very briefly uh, how we install and, and run and, and configure one of these proxies. And then we're going to actually look at how we, how we use it. How do we watch what's going on between our browser or our device and, and the server that we're talking to. And we're going to look at how we intercept both requests going to the server, modify them before they get there, and even the responses back to us from the server and we'll change some of the responses from the server and I'll show you why that might be useful, why that's a, a clever way to do security testing. Because proxies are fundamental to HTTP, they've been there since the very earliest designs of HTTP as a protocol, it's important that we just get a baseline somewhat quickly on, on how HTTP works so we understand how the proxies fit and then why this is such a valuable and effective way to test. HTTP is fundamentally a request response protocol. And there are lots of protocols in the world that are like this. You know, your client is going to send a request and it's going to ask for some kind of uniform resource identifier, in this case, you know, slash. And it includes some other header information that, that sort of qualifies that request and, and helps the server understand what we're actually getting at and what kinds of uh, replies would be acceptable. Servers respond. They tell you what they found. Uh, they give you the content uh, in response to your request. 
And my little footnote there is, is fairly important. Client could be almost anything. It could be a web browser. It could be your mobile device. It could be some program that's making requests of another program, uh, but doing it with HTTP. So a lot of a lot of things speak HTTP, not just uh, not just web browsers and mobile devices. The request has a structure like this. Uh, that top line has a method or or a verb. You know, what do you want to do? I want to get something. Okay, what do you want to get? I want to get slash training. And in the early days when HTTP was first created, I mean, the idea of running more than one web server on the same IP address was a little bit novel, um, and, uh, but it wasn't very long before we realized how valuable that would be. And that's why the host is sort of separated out as its own header. So yeah, I'm looking for slash training. In particular, I'm looking for slash training on www.sigital.com. And there's a bunch of other headers in here that tell us things about the request. The user agent, for example, identifies what kind of web browser uh, is making this request, what kind of client it is. And this is how, for instance, some websites will react to a mobile browser and say, oh, oh, I see, this is a mobile client. Let's send them the mobile version of our website. Because Safari on iOS will send a different, uh, a different user agent string than, say, Chrome on Windows. Of course, that user agent header, it's just a string. It can lie. There's no reason to believe that that's really what's on the other end. It's just a hint. In fact, one of the ways that we sometimes test websites is to get a plugin in our browser that allows us to uh, change the user agent string that it sends. There's a few other things in there, like the refer, uh, which says, you know, I came to this URL because I clicked on a link at this other place. Completely optional could be faked. There's no reason to believe that the referrer really is true. And finally, cookies. And we'll talk about cookies um, a little bit later. Servers reply like this. And servers will give you some kind of immediate response code that just tells you, you know, how did we do? And in this case, you know, 200 means okay. You know, whatever it was you asked me to do, it, it worked out okay. There's a whole range of possible responses from, you know, like 302, the thing you're looking for isn't here, it's somewhere else. You know, 404 we're all familiar with, not found. You know, you can have like you can have malformed requests, you can have you know requests too big. There's all kinds of possible responses there. And then it too follows with a bunch of headers. Uh, some of which are kind of pointless, like you know, powered by and, and so on. And some of them are you know helpful like content type telling you I'm the, the body of my response to you is in HTML format as opposed to say t plain text or, or XML. Here you see set cookie as well. This is how the server says uh, you need to start sending this cookie to me so I can remember who you were. Finally there's a blank line and then there's the actual body that's intended for the web browser. If you know anything about email, SMTP, uh, over the wire, it's practically the same thing. A bunch of headers, a blank line, and some body. You know, this is how we've done protocols for you know 20, 30 years. Things have to be encoded when they're transmitted over the wire, um, and so there's a couple of different encodings that you see. When we're talking about HTTP, we have this URL encoding. Now, HTML, the body of the web page, is a completely different encoding. But over the wire, we use this URL encoding uh, that you should be familiar with. And this is what a request looks like, right? We have the URL. It has a few parameters here. Parameter 1 is A, B, C, a space, 1, 2, 3. Parameter 2 is the letter A. There's a third parameter, B. It has no value, but it's defined. It's null, but it's, it's defined. And then we have another way of representing requests, which is RESTful. Right? And so uh, REST web services actually encode a lot of data in the URL, and they follow a format that makes it all uh, fairly logical. So rather than having this complex thing that has to be parsed with a question mark, it's equals, ampersands, um, there's a structure to the URL itself 
so that you can have like a collection of resources and a resource identifier. But it's fundamentally the same sort of thing. And then they have a whole uh, idiom around how restful services are used. And they do more than just get and post. You can have put, you can have delete. And you can operate on the collection itself. You can op operate on individual items. And this is just one of the ways to do a RESTful web service. There are, there are other sort of ways to embody a RESTful web service. This is just an example. So knowing that these things are happening under the hood, we also have cookies. And you've got cookies as a means of tying one request to the next. See, HTTP, from its very beginnings, did not contemplate any notion of like a session. You just make a request, you get a response. And it wasn't very long after we created HTTP that we realized, well, gosh, it would be really nice to know that you know, these requests are all part of a session. They're all part of one person's interaction with us. And so we created this cookie process by which you, the server sends you a token, identifies your session, and then your session, your browser, your device keeps sending it back with each subsequent request. I, uh, I liken that to a, an auction. You know, if you register for a, a, an auction in the real world, you know, they'll take your name, details, and everything and hand you a little paddle or a little card or something has a number on it. You're number 18 in the auction. And from then on, you're number 18. Ah, that's you. You're bidding. Okay, 18 has won this. 18 has bid this much. You know, that's what cookies are. You kind of come to the website and say, hi, I want to have a conversation with you. And the website says, sure, here's a cookie. Keep showing me this cookie, and I'll realize that it's still you that I'm talking to. There's two kinds. The persistent ones have an expiration date. They survive resetting or restarting your browser, rebooting your computer, restarting your mobile device. And they're stored in that device as long as the expiration date tells it to be stored. And you have session cookies, which have no expiration date, and by definition are not stored, so that they uh, don't persist, two fundamental kinds. There's a lot more to cookies, but they're not really part of what we're talking about today, so I'm not going to dig into it very deeply. And that's what they look like on the wire. The server sends it to you, says you know, set cookie, blah, 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 and then your uh, browser says, okay, great, from now on I will send it to you. I also want to do a quick detour into uh, TLS and SSL because anytime we start talking about security, people are immediately going to think to themselves, all right, cryptography, encryption, and so on. Everything I show you today has nothing to do with encryption. I want to sort of you know, level set that, help you understand that, and then we'll get into the, the interesting testing. Everything I show you today you'll see has no encryption at all, but it would all work just the same if it if if there was encryption, if there was TLS, if it was a secure website, all these things would still work. So it, that, that's an important thing to keep in mind. All TLS gets you is a bit of protection on the channel so that people can't see what's going back and forth, and some authenticity checking on the server that you're talking to. Generally, you have pretty good confidence that you are talking to the server you think you're talking to. But if your software, your website, your service, if it's buggy, if it's vulnerable, TLS doesn't protect you from anything. Just uh, to, to give you the example, you know, you got four people in a coffee shop, and one of them goes to a website to, to look at something. What can the others see? All right, so with, you, with your standard HTTP, no encryption or whatever, you know, she goes to look for a document. These other people are also on her same Wi-Fi, on the same network. What can they see? Well, they can see it, right? They can see what she sent. They can see what the server responds. Uh, worse than that, you can jump in and you can man in the middle of that and you can um, change what's being sent back and forth. If you added HTTPS, if you changed that and you said, well, we're going to do this with SSL, well, the only thing that's really changing is, well, okay, they can't see anything now. The people who are sat next to you on the same network, whether that's your office LAN or your Wi-Fi, your airport Wi-Fi, your hotel, those folks can't see what's going on. That's all that's really happened. So if you've got vulnerabilities in your website and you 
you know, if making some request is going to make something blow up, well, adding a little SSL uh, isn't going to actually change that. It's still going to blow up. So we're, with that, you know, just to, we're just level setting and making sure that we understand that SSL isn't the answer and it isn't really part of, of the security uh, of the website that we're talking about today. So let's get to the proxies. Let's talk about what a proxy is and what it does for us and why it exists. Proxies have been with us from the very beginning of HTTP as well. So we have had proxies around for a really long time. We've had them for a really good reason. Um, at its sort of most fundamental level, a proxy is simply somebody who asks or acts on your behalf. So in our little example here, you know, hey, ask Bob what the time is. Hey, Bob, what time is it? What time is 7 p.m.? Well, Bob says the time is 7 p.m. You know, that's, that's, that's just what a proxy does for you. And we have a bunch of reasons why we might use them in legitimate uh, and, and normal networks. If you work in any kind of uh, large corporate environment, especially in financial services, but in quite a few other industries, you'll find that every web request from every desktop system goes outbound through some kind of corporate web proxy. And it's doing a number of things. Like it'll check the website that you tried to go to to make sure that you're not downloading viruses or malware or other things that will you know, damage your computer and potentially uh, threaten the firm. Go check what sites you're going to to make sure you're not going to some site you shouldn't go to from the corporate network. They can even look at what's going outbound to make sure that you're not uploading corporate documents, confidential data to uh, Google, to you know, Pastebin, etc. So there's some really legitimate reasons for using proxies. And in fact, there's there's a couple of proxies types that are that are fairly common and useful. The forward proxy is the one I'm talking about that you've seen before and that you're probably most familiar with. Your browser talks to the proxy. The proxy talks to the website. You can do this for performance reasons. You can do this for some of the other reasons I named. Uh, that's, that's quite common. A reverse proxy, instead of sitting between the user and the Internet, it actually sits between the web server and the Internet. And, the, and reverse proxies exist for a completely different set of reasons. If you want to protect your website from denial of service, if you want to protect it from hackers who are sending malicious requests of, of various kinds, that reverse proxy can be a hardened device that sits the, kind of at the edge or sits between the web server and the Internet, and it takes all the abuse. And the requests that are legitimate, the requests that are well-formed and don't appear to be... Um, attacking, those actually get passed from the proxy into the web server, and those are the ones the web server will actually reply to. So it's, that's, this is just to give you the big picture of how proxies work and what they do. Um, they're built into the HTTP protocol. It understands this is a request on behalf of someone else. It's all thoroughly built in and understood by everything that speaks HTTP. The third kind of proxy is sort of open any to any not very common uh, for sort of obvious reasons these days. That's, that's kind of a security risk. So what are we doing today? We want to do some security testing. We want to test web apps. And we're using this proxy technology to do that. So instead of a proxy being a thing that lives out in the network somewhere and is run by the IT staff, uh, we're actually going to run a program on our laptop or on our network, I'm oh, no, sorry, on our laptop or on our desktop, and we're going to make all of our web traffic pass through it. And these programs that serve as a proxy in this way, they're meant for this. They're meant to stop the request, let you take a look at it, possibly make some changes, and then send it on its way. Or they can sit and they can passive, passively observe uh, what your requests are doing, and they can passively help you see what's passing between the client and the server. Now there's another use case that's fairly useful that I don't have time to discuss today, but that's actually connecting a mobile device through your proxy. So you could run the proxy on your laptop or your desktop, 
And you can run your mobile device and all of its requests through that proxy. And then you can look at them. You could tamper with them and change them. You could do all sorts of testing of mobile apps this way as well. This gets a little bit complicated because your proxy, like your laptop or your desktop computer, and the mobile device have to be on the same network, or they have to be on networks that can talk to each other. And sometimes that's difficult, because you might have a desktop system on a corporate LAN, and then you have your mobile device or your testing device on some untrusted Wi-Fi somewhere, or maybe it's on the, the 3G uh, or 4G network, which can't talk directly to your corporate LAN. So this gets a little bit complicated, and, it, and maybe it's a subject for another webinar one day. Um, but it is a valuable and, and useful way to test mobile applications. So here we go. We're going to dig into the meat of this thing. We're going to, I'm going to set up the test environment and show you how this works. There's going to be a lot of interactive demos here where you watch me do stuff. And uh, we'll go over installation. We'll go over configuration. We will uh, talk about a few pitfalls and gotchas that you really need to look out for. And finally, we'll do some interesting things. All right, so there's really two proxies worth considering if you're going to do this kind of security testing. Um, the Z attack proxy from OWASP is free. If you're not familiar with OWASP, it's the Open Web Application Security Project, and it's a nonprofit organization that just gathers lots of free security materials together and disseminates them. Lots of people are familiar with the OWASP top 10 because of the top 10 vulnerabilities and risks in web applications. And we often care that we don't have those same vulnerabilities in our own web applications. I'm helping OWASP put together the top 10 mobile risks, which are separate and different from the web risks. Some are similar and some are different. So anyways, everything from OWASP is free, including this attack proxy that you can download and it will do most of what you, you see me do today. I'm going to demonstrate Burp Suite, not because it's a commercial product. In fact, everything you see me do today, I do with the free version. Um, it's just, it's the tool that security people know. I mean, because my job is, is a security guy, Burp Suite is built by security people for security people. And when I go to do a security test, you know, the, the, when I've been hired to do that, I need all the full features of, of the commercial version of this thing. Um, you can get by with the free version, and everything that you see me do today, and, and lots more, can be done with the free version. And most of those commercial features you only need if you're going to be like a security tester um, who does this you know, for a living. So let's do the first demo here. I want you to see a number of things that are going to happen. Um, we're going to start with a, a program called WebGoat, which is another tool from OWASP. And WebGoat is a deliberately vulnerable web application. So you run this web application. I'm just running it on my laptop. I'm talking to it on my laptop. It's, it's not on the internet. It doesn't do anything for real. And it actually has all these lessons built in to teach you how to hack it. So not only is it deliberately vulnerable, but it will then sort of walk you through lesson by lesson. Here's a kind of a vulnerability. Why don't you have a go at hacking it? And if you have any trouble, well, there's tutorials, there's solutions. It's all right there to show you how, how to do it. Uh, WebGoat is just a jar file that you can download. If you're wondering where to get it, all those URLs are in the presentation. You'll be able to download those later. Uh, and so, you know, you just run it from a command line, you invoke the jar, and, and magic happens. Um, the good news and the bad news is there's no GUI, there's nothing to click, which means these instructions are exactly the same whether you're on a Mac or Windows or Linux. You run a command line, java-jar, off you go. Uh, likewise for burp. Burp also comes as a jar file. And you just run Java and the jar file. Uh, fortunately, it comes with a, a nice GUI. So downloading and installing these things is fairly trivial because you just download a jar file and run it. You don't need administrative privileges. It doesn't install itself anywhere. Um, 
Yes, let's delete these old temporary files. So you don't need any, um, any special privileges to do any of this stuff. And so if you're working in a locked down corporate environment, that's okay. This will work out just fine. All right, so we've got um, Burp running. WebGoat, you can't see that it's running. But if I bring up Firefox and I tell Firefox to go to localhost port 8080 slash webgoat, you'll see that a web page loads because uh, webgoat is in fact running. Right, so let's have a look at the proxy. Uh, all the interesting things that you need to set up are going to be here under this button. There we go. There's our proxy button. And you're going to need to set up certain options. In particular, I find that by default, intercept is turned on. Intercept means this proxy will receive the, the request your browser makes, but it will stop it and it'll hang on to it. It'll give you a chance to edit it. And you'll see me do all those things later. But it stops every request. And, and generally, you don't want that. Generally, you turn the intercept on when you have a specific thing you want to do. And most of the time while you work, you leave that turned off. Right, so we have some options we need to set. So I'm going to go to options. Got to make sure that it's actually running. So there's that tick box there. And in my case, I have the problem of WebGoat wants to run on port 8080. But oftentimes, these proxies want to run on port 8080. So I actually have to edit, and I have to make this thing run on port 9090 so that I have some place to go. Remember earlier I said you could use the proxy to handle mobile requests as well as things that your own laptop does? And that's this right here, listening on all interfaces as opposed to listening to the loopback only. So by default, it'll only listen on the loopback address, meaning it'll only listen to other programs that are running on your laptop. It won't listen on the network. And so you have to set this option here to make it do that. Right. So we've got the proxy listening, and that's handy. But we don't have a, my web browser's not using it yet. In fact, if you go look at the HTTP history field here, these are all the requests that my browser has, has made, and you can see that it's empty. My browser hasn't made any requests yet, or at least none that have flowed through the proxy. So now we're going to pop back over to Firefox, and we're going to have Firefox, we're going to configure it so that it uses the proxy. So I go to Firefox Preferences, go to Advanced, go to Network, and then come in here. So you can see we've got port 9090 here, which is because back in the proxy configuration, I said 9090 here. Those two things have to be the same. Your web browser has to know where to go, and Burp has to be listening where the web browser is talking. All right, so there's my history. I'm back at Firefox. So Firefox has a couple useful choices. No proxy at all, which means it just directly connects to the internet. Um, use the system proxy, which says ask the operating system uh, what, what the proxy ought to be, uh, or manual. And so that's what I'm going to choose here. Another gotcha to look out for is this no proxy for. Uh, I often don't want certain things passing through the proxy, and localhost will often be here. Certainly for my demo today and possibly for things that you test, you don't want that. I need my web connections to this WebGoat thing running here on my laptop. I need those to pass through the proxy. So I have to make sure that localhost does not appear there. If it did, then, then my browser would not send those requests via the proxy. Okay, so now Firefox is configured to talk to the proxy. The proxy is listening. So 
So you can see the, here's my, my history. My history up here, just watch this little section while I go log in on WebGoat. Guest, guest. Click sign in, boom, and there you go. You can see some activity over in the command line. That's just WebGoat processing my requests. And you can see all these requests that came along here that were the result of my logging in. And you get a lot of really interesting details here. Here's the, the, the money shot. This is the important one. This is the request to actually log in. So you can see all the headers up here. This is the, the raw request, right? That's the, the raw tab here. So we're seeing just what went over the wire. There's a couple of other convenient views on it. So we have you know, the type of data, the name of that data, and its value. We can look at just the headers. We can see what, what headers my browser was sending. So for instance, there's my user agent that tells you I'm on a Mac. It's version 10.10. .10. It's obviously Firefox version 45, and all these other things. There's my J session ID. Now take a look at that, by the way, my J session ID of C77 blah, blah, blah. Here's a common behavior that you see. It's a good behavior. It's a secure behavior that you see in uh, web apps. I send the request with one session identifier. I'm going to log in. Here's my username and my password. The response from the server it has two things. One is a 302. What you're looking for is not here. What you're looking for is over here. It's going to send me to the welcome page now that I've logged in. But very importantly, it changed my session ID. The old session ID was somebody who was not logged in. This new session ID represents someone who is logged in. So it's a very good and a very normal security behavior. So this is just an example of the kinds of things that you can see when using a proxy. So this is you know, the demo number one, the, the, the first of our three techniques. It's just literally look, looking around and seeing how things work. We're going to do a lot more interesting stuff than that. I want to take a second to talk about uh, a couple of gotchas, a couple of pitfalls, things to, to look out for. So why I use Firefox for any of my proxy-based testing is because of this dialog box where it lets you say, hey, Firefox, do something different from everybody else. See, most other browsers, Chrome, Safari, Internet Explorer, most of these browsers do whatever the operating system is doing for proxies. And so if I wanted to use Chrome for this demo, for example, what I would have to do is fire up my system preferences, tell my operating system, network, advanced, proxies, and I would have to tell my operating system to you know, use a proxy here for this, this connection for the web. And that means that not only would my web browser go through for, not only would I see my web browser's traffic, I'd see everything. Now, what kinds of things would I see? Well, uh, you know, Dropbox is out there checking to see whether files have been changed. You probably have an antivirus that makes HTTP requests out to go get the latest versions of antivirus definitions. You have all sorts of things that are kind of running in the background. You have every web page, the Facebook and, and Twitter and goodness knows what else, they're all making HTTP and HTTPS requests. And so they would all be flooding through Burp right now uh, just as background noise. And while I'm testing, that's a huge distraction because uh, I'm, I'm trying to find the thing that I'm looking for, and meanwhile, it's just streaming like the matrix, uh, request after request from all sorts of activities on, on a normal system. So that's fundamentally why I always use uh, Firefox for, for these kinds of things, because it's a pain to test if everything on your whole laptop is running through this proxy while you're testing. If you did what I suggested earlier about the mobile apps, 
if you were running a, an entire mobile device through your proxy, well, you're stuck. All of it is going to be going through the proxy. There's, there's no way to sort of configure Safari, go through the proxy, but nothing else go through the proxy. So that means iMessage and the App Store and Apple Music and you know, all these things, Game Center, all these activities on your mobile devices, they're all fundamentally HTTP and they will all come flooding through your proxy. But there's no real way around that. Mobile devices, that's, that's just what happens. The other thing to look out for is lots of apps want to use port 8080. Chances of something being on your desktop or your laptop listening on port 8080 right now, pretty good. It's just, it happens a lot. It's just a common thing. And so WebGoat, this thing, that I, this uh, program I'm demonstrating with you, is not the only program that does that. Well, 8080 turns out to be the default port for most of the proxies, too. And that just means that you're going to need to change something. You can't have two programs listing on the same port. So either you find your software like WebGoat and Tomcat or whatever, and you tell it to go someplace else, or you do what I did and you just move your proxy to port 9090 and, and call it done. But just be aware that if you go to fire up the proxy and it doesn't work, that could be part of the problem. Finally, um, if you're in a corporate environment and you've got a proxy, and many corporate environments have a proxy, you might have to configure Burp or Zap to have an upstream proxy. And that means that your browser sends it to Burp, Burp sends it to the corporate proxy, and the corporate proxy sends it to the internet. So you may run into situations like that where it's just nothing works unless BERT is configured to also use the proxy that your desktop normally would use. And I can show you where that is because it's not obvious. Um, if you need to have an upstream proxy, I thought it would be, you know, here under your proxy option. But it's not. It's over here under options and you have this whole upstream proxy server. When you go to create one, you actually get to set a bunch of choices. So you could say, well, for the test lab, for the app that I'm testing, you know, go one way, and for everything else, go another way. So your destinations. You may find, for example, that your corporate proxy, if you're at a bank and you have a corporate proxy, uh, you may, in fact, have to authenticate. So you might have to give it your Windows NT credentials and actually stipulate a domain name, a Windows domain and a password and so on. So this is how you would do that. Okay. So that gets us through the basics here. So let's do some interesting things. You know, proxying is really good for bypassing client-side protections or, or client-side um, restrictions. So if you have, for example, um, I don't know, a good example, you go to sign up for an account and it says, you know, your account name must be at least four letters long. Sometimes that's JavaScript in the web page, checking how long the account number is that you ask the account name that you asked for. And so if you try to have an account whose username is A, the, the, the JavaScript in the web page says, no, no, it has to be at least four characters. But if we use a proxy, we can type a 10-letter username, click Submit, catch it in the proxy before it actually makes it to the server, and change it so that we put a, a, a one-letter username in there. And that way... Um, we test whether the server actually enforces this rule, not just whether the web page JavaScript enforces the rule. And so we're going to see a few things like that. We're actually going to demonstrate a couple of these catch it in flight and uh, check it out, change it, and send it on. We're going to actually do this. So here's our second demo. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to catch a request and I'm going to tamper with it 
And that will let you sort of see how that looks when you do it. So let me bring back WebGoat. And this time we're going to look at the uh, improper error handling. Now, you need to kind of ignore the name of the lesson that I'm using uh, because I'm trying to, to find a vulnerability that we could, you know, we can use with a certain technique. Um, ignore the fact that this particular one is improper error handling. Just, you know, we're going to go look at this. Let's get burp on our screen so we can see. So we see the requests going through. Uh, a helpful thing to do sometimes is to actually clear the history so that I'm looking at a fresh blank screen and I know that the only things that come up now are related to the current test I'm working on. So I'll type in, you know, username, Paco, password, whatever, invalid username and password, right? Great. And so you can see that up here. Here's the request, uh, username Paco, password Fubar, and so on. So what I want to do now, I'm going to restart the lesson so it's all clear. And I'm going to clear my history again so you can see what's going on. And now let's take this bit by bit. First, I'm going to turn on intercept. So while I'm on the proxy, I go to intercept, and I'm going to turn intercept on. Now that means no requests passing through my proxy will go unless I manually release them and let them go. In fact, as I type my username and password and I click submit, watch this word intercept, and you'll see that it's going to light up yellow to tell me that it's, it's holding a request that needs my attention. So the goal of this lesson is to authenticate as WebGoat without entering a password. All right, so I'll type WebGoat as my user. I'll type whatever as my password. And I click login. And there you can see it's lit up yellow to tell me I, I have something waiting. Uh, whoops. And so there's the, the request. It's telling me what it's going, what it's doing. And here's the parameters. I'm not sure why it did it that way. And here's the parameters that are going on. So WebGo, password, foobar. To show you what I'm going to do, this is the way that you, you succeed on this lesson. I'm actually going to remove the password parameter entirely. It's just not going to be there. It's not an empty password. The parameter is just not even present. Now I could click forward and this would go to the server. As a matter of convenience, I'm not going to do that because there's going to be a bunch of other requests that come after it and each of them will get stuck here in the proxy and I'll have to manually click forward. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to turn intercept off. It will take my currently modified request, it will send it on, but it's not going to stop any other requests. The rest of it will just keep going. So I click this, and a bunch of uh, requests went. See, here's the one that I modified. Um, see the, the edited there. And let's go take a look at the server's response. You can see the response here. Congratulations, you've successfully completed this lesson. You can see it in Firefox. Welcome, WebGoat. Now, if you're at all familiar with web apps, you're thinking to yourself, what? Are you kidding me? Like this, this application actually fails in such a way that you log in successfully if the password parameter is completely missing? That sounds ridiculous. You know, we've seen this sort of thing. Like, <laughs> The security guys who built this lesson in WebGoat didn't make that up, thinking that maybe there's somebody out there who's written a web app that way. They've seen it somewhere. I've seen things like this. Uh, it really does happen. But the, the point was we captured that request, right? We, uh, oops, I'm bad. we captured that request, modified it, and then sent it on. And that's a really important technique. That's our second technique that I wanted to do. 
Let me show you one other thing very related to that. Restart the lesson. And instead of capturing, so we're going to type webgoat and another password and log in. And this login's a failure. Right, we know that. I can actually come up here to that find that request in my list and right click and send this to the repeater. And so you'll see that the repeater has lit up yellow to tell me that it has something for me. And there's my request. If I want to play around a little bit and try a few different variations on this, it sat here just the way it was a minute ago. And I can come through and I could say, well, let's try, you know, password, password two. And I can click go. And I get invalid password. Oh, bummer. But now I can just, I can click remove here. And I can click go again. Congratulations. Right, so this is a, a way to also do variations on a request. So you see something weird and you think, huh, I wonder what that would be like. And you can come in and you can try different things. If this were an app that I didn't know and I wanted to try things, you could believe I would tamper with things like, you know, this screen number or this menu number. Because I would think to myself, what if I can name a screen or a menu that I'm not supposed to have access to? And what if by naming that number there, I saw a part of the app that I shouldn't see? So this is how I would do that uh, in an exploratory testing fashion. I would come find the interesting requests by looking in my history. And interesting requests are ones that, that have things like parameters. They result in 302 if they're a login request. Those are interesting requests. And then I would send them over to the, the repeater, mess with them a little bit, and try different variations, looking for something that might be, you know, uh, might indicate a problem, like welcome, you've authenticated. Right, so now the last one. This last demo is really interesting. Um, and I gotta tell you, I've gotten so much mileage out of tampering with the response from the server when I have a very complicated client. When there's a lot of complex JavaScript going on in the web browser, or you have a complex mobile app, and it's, it's hard to get the mobile app to do things that you don't want it to do, or you can send it a request, uh, a response. You tamper with what the server sent it. And then sometimes it will make requests based on a broken worldview, based on a, a faulty knowledge of what's going on uh, in, in the app. Let me show you what I mean. There's another great lesson for this in, uh, in WebGoat. So WebGoat has the uh, Ajax security section. And in particular, we have this XML inject. Again, you know, kind of ignore what the lesson is about. The lesson's trying to identify something wrong in the software. I'm trying to show you a time when tampering with the server response makes sense. So here's what happens. Here's the way this thing works. Normally, you type in your, your account ID. You hit submit, and it says, all right, you have 100 points. Here's the things you can choose from. And you pick one, and you click submit, and, you know, Hooray, it says, you know, this will be shipped to your address. Hurrah. So that's the, that's the happy path case. Clearly, I don't have enough points for the Web Goat Hawaii Cruise or the Core 2 Duo Laptop, etc. Right, so our goal here is to make those options available to me and, and perhaps even claim one. I restart the lesson to, to sort of clear the state and get it set up so you can see what I'm going to do. I'm also going to go back to my proxy and I'm going to clear the history here so that it becomes really easy to see what's going on. So watch what happens when I enter the account ID. I hit submit 
And here comes a request, and, and my proxy has captured it. There's the request. Look what the response to this request is from the server. Huh, it's some XML. That's interesting. So that XML very clearly is what sets up this set of rewards. There's obviously some JavaScript in the web page that says, right, take the rewards that come back in XML and let's put a tick box next to it and make it an option for the user. Well, I want to put other options down here. So again, let me restart the lesson and let me show you, and I'll clear again so that it's, it's obvious what's happening here. And this time, I'm going to go back to intercept. And I'm going to tell it to intercept a request. So intercepting is now on. Every request will be intercepted. Now what's interesting about this is I'll go ahead and put in my, my username, uh, my account number rather, and hit submit. And as, as we saw before, you know, there it is. It's, it's lit up to tell me that it's got something for me to do. And what I'm going to do is actually let this request go, but I'm going to do a special action. Action. Do intercept response to this request. So just that one. I do want to intercept the response to this request. Okay? So I've told it to intercept, and I'm going to let that go. Boom. So here's my XML. This is the response. It has come from the server, has not gone to my web browser yet. So I'll make the edit, do a little copy-paste, and say, oh, you know, let's see, it's the web goat, you know, Hawaii vacation. And I'm going to, again, do the trick I did before. I'm going to turn intercept off, which will have the side effect of letting this go, as well as not intercepting anything more. Boom. So it's gone. So now that response returned to my web browser. And if I go look in my web browser, there you go. Web go to Hawaii vacation, and it has a tick box. I can select it. Congratulations, you successfully completed this lesson. So this is how we changed what the server response was. And there's probably no legitimate way to make the server respond that way. But we can fake the client, and the client says, oh, he must be allowed to have that option. And so the client puts it on the screen and lets me select it. So that's our third demo, and that's the third really powerful technique, which is you know, editing the response from the server to trick the client into doing something weird. I want to wrap up and leave just a bit of time for questions. We're coming close to the top of the hour. Um, the, the value of a proxy is the ability to get way off the happy path. Right? The value of this proxy is getting over into some very strange territory that is just not possible to produce with regular testing. You're not going to get that response from the server because the server would never give you that response. It's also going to let you get better coverage of errors and edge cases and so on, like that time when I took a parameter out entirely. How are you going to get a web browser to send a login request and not even send the password field? It's, it's pretty hard to do with just a web browser, but it's fairly easy to do with a proxy. And like I said, all the checking done in JavaScript for whether things are good, bad, or the right format, that's all done, and then we make a change. So proxies are really valuable in that regard. There are a few disadvantages. I mean, clearly this is all about manual testing. Um, and you can get automation, and you can you know, get the commercial features that will go around and spray things at your web apps. Um, and you can end up spending a lot of time trying to get a few results, though these results tend to be fairly spectacular. It might require some deep insight into how your app works to do something useful, but 
if you're a tester on that app anyways, you probably have that insight and that test data. This slide is simply here now so that if you, uh, uh, so that it appears in the downloadable copy of the slides later. So the things that I talked to you about, they're here in this slide. You can go look them up and, and download them. So I want to wrap up uh, just with my, uh, my favorite quote for these sorts of things, uh, which is, you know, the best time to plant an oak tree, yeah, it was 20 years ago. But the next best time to plant an oak tree is right now. You know, so the best time to do this sort of security testing, well, I was probably back when we were designing and, and rolling out the first version. But the next best time to do the security testing is, is right now in the version that you have. And so it's never too late to get in there and do a bit of security testing. So with that, uh, I'm, I'm done with the prepared material. I'm going to turn it over to Dara, who's going to look at some of the questions and see if there's something I can answer for you. Thank you very much, Paco, for that. That's, I like that quote there as well at the end. It's a very interesting one. Um, so there's a lot of information there, guys, and this is being recorded, so I'll have it over on Test Huddle very shortly, and you can see the slides as well. You can go back through all the resources. Um, also on Test Huddle, you can have a look at a webinar that we did last, uh, last year uh, with Paco called uh, Zen and the Art of Security Testing. Just going to share the link with you guys there. And before we look at the questions, I just want to just go through one or two slides here. And here you can see some webinars we have coming up next month. We've got a webinar with Christopher Nordstrom on the topic of Kanban testing and Lego. And then um, on Wednesday the 20th, we have a webinar on mobile testing with Marit Puyarvi. And to wrap up next month's webinar series, we have a webinar with Karen Johnson, we will be looking at the t topic of how manual testers can help with automation efforts. And right now, over on the Eurostar website, you can check out our pre-launch discount of 20%. So there's some more information over there. And you can also find out about our Eurostar Roadshow 2016, which will be taking place next month. We're heading off to Warsaw for a one-day testing event where there's lots of different talks covering areas such as digital testing, automation, security, with different uh, speakers there, such as, as Declan O'Riordan, uh, Dorothy Graham, Ruth Tunison, and many more. So head over there and check that out. So finally, uh, let's, let's have a look at some of the, the questions that have come through for you here, Paco. And the first question I have is asking, uh, what's the dif difference from proxy server and firewall on the server of a large corporate IT firm? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, so firewalls, while they do sort of look at the packets that go through, I mean, they're really looking at everything kind of uh, packet by packet. Uh, you could almost think of it like looking at a document letter by letter or word for word, um, whereas a, an HTTP proxy, first off, it's going to decrypt, like the TLS connection is, is broken, up, broken down. It's actually looking at what's passing by. It's going to take a look at, oh, this is an actual file download. Let's take that file download and run it against an antivirus and make sure that there's no viruses in that file before we let that go onto a web browser. Whereas a firewall, it's really kind of packet by packet, um, you know, oh, this is part of an HTTP connection. All right, that's good enough. So, I mean, it's just the level of sort of, at what level they operate is the, is the key difference there. We have another question here, or actually one or two people have been asking about um, the Fiddler proxy and your views on it, and how does it compare to the Burp Suite? Okay, so Fiddler is uh, an extension to Internet Explorer, and, and it runs on Windows. Uh, you can see that I'm a Mac guy. Uh, Fiddler can do many, many of the things I've just shown you, and so it's a fine thing to do um, if what you want to do is uh, tamper with some requests in your web browser. Uh, some things that Fiddler, I don't believe, can do, for example, would be uh, listening for connections from something other than Internet Explorer itself. So I gave you the example of connecting your mobile apps through Burp and being able to um, route the mobile web connections through Burp and tamper with them and so on. And I'm fairly sure that they cannot do that. 
My experience with Fiddler is fairly weak, but, but I know a lot of people who rely on it and get good security testing done with it. Another person here is asking, um, how do you keep up with the latest security test uh, techniques? Well, um, I'm going to say you almost don't have to because, frankly, all the hackers out there are using the same old stuff over and over and over again. Um, it, it's not so much that you have to look for the most recent discovery. It's, it's seriously just a matter of going through the same sorts of security issues that, that we've run into before. Um, that web goat tutorial, if you haven't been all the way through it and done every lesson in it, that's a, a fine place to start because there's so many just silly little things that people have done in web apps and they've been turned into some really high quality lessons in there. And, you know, OAuth is all free, it's all uh, available. Uh, so it's not so much being up to date in terms of the latest, greatest, you know, uh, vulnerability with a logo on it, as much as you know, having a, a full sense of all the different vulnerabilities that people usually do, because that's what the, that's what it's getting uh, being the subject of a hack is just some stupid little thing that that we've done before. Okay, we'll take another question there, and this this uh, person is asking. What tool do you advise to use to test the CRM web tool? Uh, a CRM, if, if I understand you know, sort of customer relationship management, I mean, it's just software as a service. Um, and uh, like anything else, it's fundamentally delivered over the web. Um, this is a fine thing to do if you're trying to test at a, at a low level, if you're trying to test the, the requests and responses. Uh, if you're trying to do, do say, a, a B2B, like you, you've got a program that fires up and makes HTTP requests to your CRM, and you're trying to watch what goes on there, uh, yet again, Burp can be used that way because your command line program can be told, when you make web requests, do it through a proxy. And suddenly you will start seeing the requests that that program is making. Uh, and, and you'll, you'll even be able to stop them, and you'll be able to tamper with them, just like we did requests made by our browser. Another question here, Paco, is asking, which security approach works better, manual or, or automatic? Oh, I, you know, that's, that's uh, you, you can't really answer it like that. Um, the automated tests cover, like, the, all the stupid stuff that you'd just be negligent if you didn't find it, you'd be negligent if you left it in your app. So there's all sorts of stupid little things like session handling and direct object reference and you know, cross-site scripting. A lot of that stuff is really trivial to find with a, a tool that just sprays bad requests. And that's, yeah, that's really good. Um, you kind of need that. But there's a whole class of things you will simply not find that way. You can't expect to and you can't, it's not like you just need to buy the better automated option. And the, the example I gave you of looking at the menu number or the screen number and saying, huh, what if I tried that and got a screen that I shouldn't get? There's no automated tool that can understand this person shouldn't see this screen. Like That's just not going to happen. Um, it takes a human to go through and, and sort of look at that stuff and, and understand the the meaning, the, the result of uh, what you've tested and, and the impact of it. So it isn't an either or manual versus automated and anybody who tries to uh, frame it that way is just making a false argument to begin with. Okay, we're, we're way over there now so maybe we might just take one more question if, if that's okay Paco. And um, see there's, sure. there's a question here that's asking is there some sort of software uh, some software that will automate this kind of man-in-the-middle attacks, for example, automatically switch out values, omit arguments, etc., from just one response until it gets an expected value? Um, yes. I mean, the, the short answer is yes, of course. Um, and if you, uh, Dara, do you want to pass back control real quickly? I mean, it's a tab. Sure. On, uh, it, it's a tab on Burp. Um, so I will show my screen and, and on Burp they have a they have the intruder which will uh, take you to positions and give it payloads and you can decide what sorts of payloads you want to apply 
you have a scanner that will scan across a website looking for following every link. You have spiders that will do this thing. That's some of the commercial features of Burp, uh, the kinds of things you don't get for free. There's a bunch of limitations. Uh, and of course, AppScan uh, and uh, WebInspect are two well-known tools that do this as well. Uh, so yeah, absolutely, uh, there are ways to, to automate these sorts of things. I, I think it's worth pointing out. I gave you my email address, my Twitter handle. Uh, I totally am open to you know requests and questions, and people should follow me on Twitter. I see interesting things, and by all means, you know, shoot me an email and ask your questions. I'm totally happy to respond. Yes, indeed, and Paco is quite active on Twitter, so um, you can follow him there. I, I believe I saw you changed your name as well recently, Paco, on, on Twitter. Indeed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Bodie McFace, we got to we gotta vote and make that happen. <laughs> well, um, that that's all for today. Um, we're gone we're gone away over. So thank you all for coming along and um, staying that little bit extra. And uh, thank you to today's presenter, Paco. It's he's always filling us with lots of great information. So this webinar has been recorded, and I will be adding it to Test Huddle very shortly. So head over there; you can view it and register for more webinars down the line. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you all.